We're going to be back in Matthew 15 and 16 this morning. If you'll turn to Matthew 15, 32, will be the first place we are. Hate to ask this question right out loud, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you are old enough to remember when the world record for the 100 meters was over 11 seconds? It hadn't really been that terribly long ago, but long enough. Uh, most world-class athletes can beat the 11-second mark now. Uh, a lot of guys in college uh, are beating the 11-second mark. The women's record is in the 10s, and Usain Bolt put the men's record at 9.58 seconds back in 2009. Uh, he's a freak of nature, but that's amazing. Typically what happens is when we have a new record, we remember that at the expense of all the other records. There were other people who set records in the 100 meters all down through the history of the 100 meters being run. But we don't remember any of those guys. We remember Usain Bolt uh, and the 9.58. Uh, so when we talk about miracles of Jesus, are there records that you think about? This morning, we're, we're not going to spend a lot of time in the miracle itself. We're going to talk about some of the aftermath of the miracle. But when I say Jesus fed a large group of people, what's the number that comes to your mind? 5,000, right? That's the record. Uh, as far as we know, Jesus fed 5,000 plus on one occasion. So we don't think quite as much about that other time when Jesus fed a very large group of people. So look at Matthew chapter 15. In verse 32, he had been up on a mountainside. Big crowds of people had come. He'd been teaching and healing all day. Verse 32, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse along the way. And his disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have, Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he'd given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over, and the number of those who ate was 4,000 men, besides women and children. And after Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got in the boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan. So we have a 4,000 feeding that kind of pales into the background because of the feeding of the 5,000. But this one actually has a tremendous importance to it as well. If you remember, right after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus talked to the people about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and a lot of his disciples stopped following him. We have the same kind of big turning point after the feeding of the 4,000. But this isn't among the disciples. This is among the leadership at Jerusalem. This is one of those places that they try to insert themselves into Jesus' ministry and messiahship, and it causes problems not just in the short run, but in the long run as well. So let's keep reading in chapter 16, verse 1. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, today it will be stormy, because the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah, then Jesus left them, and he went away. I want us to notice, first of all, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were together on this occasion. Most of the time, Pharisees and Sadducees were fairly separated from one another for one main reason. The Pharisees considered themselves to be very, very spiritual people. The Sadducees were more political and so even when they met together in the Sanhedrin, you had a group that was always arguing for a more spiritual Israel and a group that was arguing for a more political Israel. 
The Sadducees thought that you only get one life. There's no life after death. There's no angels. There's no spirits. So you've got to do what you can do now. And if the nation of Israel is going to succeed and grow, we've got to do that through political means. The Pharisees believed in spirits, in life after death, in angels, and were very dedicated to doing things in a very spiritual way. So you can imagine the kind of clashes that the main governing body of the Jews would have had in those days. But when they came to Jesus, they came together. Right? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so the Pharisees and Sadducees came together. And my question that goes unanswered in the text, was this a group from the Sanhedrin? Was this an official delegation that was sent from the ruling body of the Jews to ask Jesus this question? Can you show us a sign? What they want is to be in charge of Jesus' ministry. What they want is for Jesus to give them a reason to put their stamp of approval on what he's doing. If he can come up with a miracle, then the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, can say, oh look, he really is legitimate and we need to get behind him and, and follow him and try to help him accomplish his messianic goals. If he cannot produce a miracle, then we're going to ostracize him. We're going to be against him. So hopefully they think that this private viewing for the bosses is going to turn out to their advantage. But Jesus doesn't give them another miracle. Now, I've got some statistics, and I may have shared these with you before, but let me just give you a few. There are three major categories of miracles that we have in the Gospels. The first one is material, things that are around you and you, you use them to the advantage of, of other people. That would include changing the water to the wine, calming the storm, walking on the water, feeding the 5,000 or the 4,000. Then there's a spiritual category, casting out demons, Jesus' transfiguration, which we're going to take a look at next week, Lord willing, and then physical healings, which is most of them, uh, things that were going wrong with people physically that Jesus healed. The man with the withered hand, in the synagogue at Capernaum, stretch out your hand and it was the same as the other. Those kinds of miracles. He had been doing them nonstop for almost three years. There was no secret about Jesus' ability to perform miracles. They didn't come because they were interested in Jesus' abilities. They came because they wanted to be in charge of Jesus' abilities. And Jesus does not give them the satisfaction of being in charge of his ministry. He also doesn't pull rank. This is one of those occasions when it would have been very easy for Jesus to do a miracle that would have blown their socks off. He could have done something outrageous. He could have opened up the skies and brought the angels down. He could have called, you know, that, that angel group that sang when he was born he could have just had them do, come do a couple of numbers, you know, show them what we've got going on here, show them how connected I really am. He could have done something to harm them. He had the ability to do whatever he wanted to do, but he doesn't identify himself as the absolute authority. He doesn't give them a greatest hits compilation. Right? That's one of the things I would have done. I would have said, well, haven't you heard about this and this and this? And You know, I spent a night one time talking to Nicodemus. He's one of you guys. Uh, he could tell you about my spiritual side and what I know about spiritual things. Uh, he could have just given them the understanding of who he was, but he doesn't. He goes to an Old Testament prophet who's really only known for one thing, if you ask a little kid that's been to Bible class, they can tell you what happened to good old Jonah, right? Jonah gets swallowed by a big fish. He's in the belly of the fish for three, three days and three nights, and then he's spat out on dry land. That's the part about Jonah that we know. I'll be very honest with you. I'm not a big Jonah fan. After he does his preaching and the people repent, do you remember what happens? It makes him mad. He's furious with God that God would actually let the Assyrians off the hook and not destroy Nineveh like he said he would. Makes Jonah look bad. He said, God's going to destroy you, and then God didn't. 
But Jesus doesn't talk about all of the Jonah story. He just talks about that one little piece that everybody knows. Jonah was swallowed. He was put into the belly of the big fish. And so as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. This was the only sign he would ever give them. There are three or four other places where they come to Jesus and they demand that he give them a sign. He always gives them the same answer. The only sign that matters is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, Jonah is mentioned 10 times in the Gospels. All 10 times are Jesus speaking. This is his favorite example from the Old Testament. He brings this up regularly because he's looking forward to something he's going to do that's going to absolutely change everything for all time. And he's the only one that knows it. But they know about Jonah and they know about the big fish so he uses that as an opportunity. Well, why? It's the only miracle that's ever been produced that has no expiration date. Right? The disciples did not go around Judea doing warranty work after Jesus went back to the Father. Right? Think about the woman's son at Nain. Right? The widow's son, Jesus meets them coming out of the city. He raises the widow's son from the dead. I don't know anything else about the widow's son at Nain except this. At some point, hopefully after his mother had long gone on to glory, he died again. Right? He didn't live forever after his resurrection. What about uh, Lazarus? Lazarus holds a record. He was in the grave the longest, right? Jesus was in the grave three days. Lazarus was in the grave four. When Jesus comes and says, loose him and let him free, and Lazarus comes out and they take off the bindings and he is raised back to life. Is Lazarus still alive on this planet? No. He died again later. His miracle served its purpose and then it was done. But the miracle of the prophet Jonah, the sign of the prophet Jonah, the resurrection from the dead, never stopped. He was raised from the dead on the third day. And here we are on the upteenth millionth day. He's still alive. That miracle is not going anywhere. So to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaders of the people, he said, I'm not going to show you some kind of uh, physical thing that I can do. I'm going to point you to the one thing that's going to be the ultimate turning point in the history of the world. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll start reading in verse 12. And if you haven't read all of 1 Corinthians 15 lately, I would encourage you to just go back and do that. This is one of those where I was trying to decide where to stop and start. And we could read the whole chapter and, and uh, not do ourselves any disservice. But I just want us to look beginning in chapter 15 and verse 12. If it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins." Those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And so for Paul, everything that we are as Christians revolves around that one question. Was Jesus able to give the sign of the prophet Jonah that he promised. Was he in the belly of the earth for the three days and then come back out as Jonah came out of the fish? Because if he didn't do that, all the rest of those miracles are just anomalies because they're all 
They're all over with. Every person he ever healed eventually died. Every person he raised from the dead has died again. If he's not alive, then there's no hope. But if he is alive, and we know him to be, everything changes. And so to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he said, you know, I'm not going to give you authority over my mission because my mission is not about this lifetime. It's not about your authority. It's about forever. And when he was raised from the tomb on the third day, he set everything in motion as it is even to our generation. All right, let's go back to Matthew 16. One more little snippet about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I always love these little passages where you find out what it was like to be one of the disciples. Parts of me think that would have been really neat. And parts of it remind me that I would have been just as confused as they always were. Jesus was working up here and his disciples were working down here. They were trying hard to understand everything that Jesus was teaching them and preparing them to do, but there was no way for them to understand everything until after his resurrection when the Holy Spirit finally came and gave them the equipment that they needed to do the job he gave them to do. Let's start reading in verse 5. They went across the lake and the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this amongst themselves and said, Is it because we didn't bring thee bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets full you gathered? Pop quiz, how many baskets full? Twelve, okay. Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets full you gathered? Seven baskets. How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking about bread. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so then they understood that he wasn't telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The New Testament, yeast is used in a good way and in a bad way, usually in a bad way. It usually means that the yeast is going to get into something and it's going to infect it and that infection is going to spread all throughout. So Paul talks about if you allow immorality in the church, then it's like yeast and it'll just infect the whole body. Uh, there's only one place that I can think of that we can be a great influence in the community in the world if we're like yeast and it grows to influence. A couple of things about Jesus' statement here. Number one, uh, and this is trivial and you can forget it after I say it, but there are two different kinds of baskets in this passage. When Jesus says, do you remember how many baskets full we took up after we fed the 5,000? And they, they would have said, well, 12. 12, and the word he uses is the word that means little baskets. So think, I'm, I'm going home from the uh, eating meeting, and I want to take some leftovers, and I get myself a plate, get a little basket. Right? There were 12 baskets. I always figured that there were 12 little baskets, because there were 12 little disciples. And so later on they were going to have leftovers for dinner. right? Loaves and fish, it's good stuff. Then he says, do you remember how many when we fed the 4,000? Right? Well, there were seven baskets left over. But these baskets are a Greek word that means a big basket. So it's not the little basket that you would take for yourself. It's the big basket that you would take when you're getting a carry out at KFC. right? You get the bucket. They got the bucket of fish to take home with them when they got that one. So it's not that there were fewer people fed and fewer leftovers when you were done. There were fewer people fed, but the leftovers were just as large, even perhaps larger. So they finally figure out that Jesus is warning them about the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees, meaning that these guys are going to be a problem. And indeed they were. Uh, it's only a few months later that the Pharisees and the Sadducees come together as a group and condemned Jesus to death. They actually set in motion the miracle they begged him to do. Isn't that funny? They had no clue. They were so earthbound, so ignorant 
of what Jesus and the Father were doing. That they arrested him, lied about him, had him beat up and crucified by the Romans to get rid of him. And what they really did was put him down in the belly of the fish so that he could come out on the third day just like he said he would do. Our Savior had the whole thing laid out so many months in advance and worked it to perfection and he's still alive and we still have hope. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for letting Jesus know how victorious he was going to be. We know it was hard for him to have to go through those things, but knowing that you were with him and knowing that he had the victory in hand was a wonderful thing. And we praise you for that sign that he gave that, that nothing can overcome him and because of him, nothing can overcome us. Father, we pray that as we live in your kingdom and as we try to do your will, that we'll look forward to that time when we become like him, when we'll be forever individuals, that you will raise us from the dead as you have raised him and that we can be with you and be in your presence, never, ever to have to go through the physical stuff again. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. If you need to respond to the invitation this morning, we would love to help you as we sing.